Well, hello, LifeSite friends. Jim Hale with you again today. This is the Tuesday before the Wednesday of the big oral arguments at the Supreme Court. As you know, they're hearing the, the, the Mississippi uh, abortion case. And uh, we're just trying to, to help everyone understand what's at stake here, um, what this debate centers around. And uh, to help us out today, we want to bring in a good friend of LifeSite, Colonel uh, John Eidsmo, who joins us today from Alabama. Hello, Colonel. How you doing? Well, just fine. Great to be with you. Well, and and I should mention that not only is uh, um, Mr. Eidsmo a retired colonel, this is a fascinating gentleman we have uh, with us today. He is also an attorney who filed this amicus brief with the Supreme Court and he is a chaplain and a member of Lutherans for Life. So, boy, uh, we we don't come across too many people with your pedigree, but uh, we're so thankful that you, that you joined us today. And, and I just want to tell our audience, so when you have big Supreme Court cases like this, different groups can, uh, can write to the court. Uh, these are amicus briefs. And one of the best ones that I have seen yet, I sat down and read this this morning, is this brief uh, that uh, that I am uh, assuming that you pinned, Colonel, um, to to the court, and it is just brilliant. And I and I and I want to just read the summary of the argument at the beginning of this amicus brief, just to start our conversation here, okay? And um, your group, the Foundation for a Moral Law says that we fully support the conditions of Petitioner Dobbs on behalf of the state of Mississippi, that Mississippi's Gestational Age Act is constitutional, that the Constitution does not guarantee a right to abortion, that the regulation of abortion is generally reserved to the states, and that Roe v. Wade and Casey v. Planned Parenthood should be overruled. Neither abortion nor privacy are mentioned in the Constitution. Wow. And then you just proceed in this brilliant paper to just completely shred any constitutionality of Roe v. Wade. Well, that's what we try to do, and I'm glad we've at least persuaded you, Jim. <laughs> yes, <laughs> definitely. Yes. Well, well tell us, what, um, why is Roe v. Wade, why was it a house of cards to begin with? Because it's based solely on, as you say, a house of cards. It's not based on the Constitution at all. It purports to establish a constitutional right to abortion, but the Constitution itself doesn't mention abortion. It doesn't mention privacy that they speak about. Rather, in the 14th Amendment, we read that, that no state shall deprive any person of <clears throat> life, liberty, or property without due process of law and Justice Blackman, the author of the opinion, says that that word liberty has emanations that form penumbras that include things like abortion and other such things. Now, when you start saying that you see emanations flowing out of the Constitution and they form penumbras or shadows or auras and the margins and so on, you have removed the Constitution from any kind of objective scholarship and it becomes just a ball of wax, as Jefferson says, that means anything any judge wants it to mean. And that's dangerous because the same court that can read into the Constitution rights that are not there can also read out of the Constitution rights that are there. And so the only real security we have for our liberties is an enduring Constitution that is judged according to the meaning of the framers, not what the whim of some 20th or 21st century judge wants it to me. Yes, and, w and when you read all the, the contortions of, you know, when we had Casey versus Planned Parenthood in 1992, and you can see the, the justices attempting to work with this faulty uh, argument from the beginning, you begin to understand why Jefferson despised the federal judiciary. These are nine unelected judges who were overruling a state legislature. That's just not right, Colonel, is it? Not only overruling a state legislature, but in the process, the state legislature is almost every state in the country. Yes. And as you say, they are unelected, as Justice Scalia said in a 
dissenting opinion in the Obergefell, the same-sex marriage case, they're not even representative of lawyers or judges as a whole. As he pointed out, he said that every one of these justices, that's not quite true today, but it was then, are graduates of either Harvard or Yale. That's not true of lawyers as a whole or judges as a whole. They concentrate in the new in the New England states, the Northeast, and the Great Lake states. He said there is not a single Southerner on the court. There's not a single Midwesterner on the court. There is not a single Westerner on the court. And then he put in parentheses, California does not count. But <laughs> yeah. then, and then he also adds, and there's not a single evangelical Protestant on the court. But point of the matter is, this unrepresentative body is making policy for the nation that it has no authority under the Constitution to make. And you know what's fascinating? This this amicus brief, I, I want to encourage everyone to go on to the... Is, is this available? Can people read this at the Foundation for a Moral Law? They can go to our website and they'll... Let's just put it this way. If it is not on the website of our foundation, I will make sure that it is a few minutes from now. Okay. But, well, I, but also they can go to the website of the United States Supreme Court. And there, if you go to a site called docket, click on docket, and I guess you would need the number of the case, which I don't have before me right now, but you can bring up all of the briefs that have been filed. In other words, it's all public record. It's on the court's website, as well as our brief will be on ours. Right. Well, it is just, it's, it's just brilliant reading to, to understand this. It's, it's really one of the most concise things I've ever read that establishes truly a, a biblical foundation for who we are as Americans. There, and you cite so much scripture in this. And, uh, and I know that's what the, the foundation for a, a, a moral law is all about it, but it, it's just so helpful to read this. You know, we live in a time now, Colonel, where Christians are so confused. Self-professing Christians attempt to find ways to talk about abortion as if there, there are some exceptions to abortion. And, and you know, I, I really think if you could just talk a little bit about about the, the the biblical basis for your position in this amicus brief, Colonel. Well, of course, the scripture says, thou shalt not kill, or some translations, thou shalt not murder. But in order to establish that that applies to abortion, we need to establish that the unborn child is a living human being. And I would begin by just looking at what happened when Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, who was carrying John the Baptist in her womb, says when she comes in the presence of Mary, who is carrying Jesus in her womb, and Elizabeth says, the babe in my womb leaped for joy. Yes. First of all, the word babe, brephos, is the same Greek word that is used elsewhere in the scripture for a baby who is already born. And secondly, we see that baby in the womb showing qualities of personhood, leaping for joy. Or you can go back to Psalm 53, where David says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Now, David isn't saying there's anything sinful about the act by which he was conceived. He is saying that he was conceived with a sinful nature. A sinful nature has to imply personhood. And so that takes personhood not just before birth, but all the way back to conception. So all of that, I think, clearly establishes that this unborn child is a living person. And therefore, it is unjust to take that innocent living person's life. Yes. Well, well, thank you for the, the just the wonderful contribution that that the Foundation for a Moral Law has made by by writing this is it's, uh, again, it, it is just outstanding. Um, uh, What's your feeling about this, Colonel? Uh, you know, we need we need five votes. Uh, we feel like we have two solid votes with Justice Thomas and Justice Alito. And then it's a little bit of a crapshoot after that. How are you feeling about what you know of the remaining three justices and how they might be swayed? We need, well, as, as I said, we need five votes. I mean, 1973, it was 5-4 against us. Uh, are, are you feeling at all confident? I'd say I'm feeling optimistic. Confident is never a word I'd use when you're dealing with the Supreme Court, but 
I am optimistic. First of all, we have seen the court gradually moving away from the Roe versus Wade framework there, the trimester framework, and the idea that the state has no compelling interest to regulate the life of the child until after the point of viability, which they wrongly defined at that point, and even more wrongly defined today as being six months after conception, medical science has moved very much in the other direction since then. And anyway, even the Planned Parenthood versus Casey decision that you described is a move somewhat away from Roe versus Wade, not far enough. And in that case, four of the justices wanted to overrule Roe versus Wade entirely even then. And you look at the justices today, as you say, I don't think there's any question that Justice Thomas and Justice Alito are going to vote to overrule Roe versus Wade. And then you've got probably Justice Gorsuch. As to Justices Kavanaugh and Barrett, I think there's a good possibility, and I'm not giving up on Chief Justice Roberts either. <laughs> oh, good. That's good you to know. You look back and forth at some of his rulings, and I think there's a, a good likelihood that he is going to vote Let's put it this way. I think that there's a strong likelihood they will vote to uphold the Mississippi law, and thereby they'll have to essentially repeal this viability test, because Mississippi's law says that there can be no abortion after 15 weeks. Now, whether in the process of upholding Mississippi's law, they totally overrule Roe versus Wade, or whether they just modify it a great deal, I think that's what the real question is going to be. And if some of our viewers here watch the hearings tomorrow or listen to the hearings tomorrow, I'd urge them to pay special attention to the questions that Justice Roberts asks and that Justices Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett ask. Those questions can be very key to give you an idea as to where they're leaning, and they could be the decisive votes. Now, another factor here <clears throat> that makes a difference, people wonder sometimes, what difference does it make that one of those, Roberts, is the Chief Justice? He doesn't get more votes than the others. But as Chief Justice, if he votes on the prevailing side, in other words, the majority agree with him, then he decides who writes the majority opinion. Uh, He'll assign it to one of the other justices. Now, if he wants a very strong opinion, completely overruling Roe versus Wade, he may assign it to Alito or to Thomas. If he wants a weaker opinion, one that will uphold the law but not go all the way on it, he might assign it to one of the others, or he might decide to write it himself. But the likelihood is they will shortly after tomorrow they'll have a conference in which they will take a vote on this and they'll make a decision. But most likely we will not find out about this until the end of this court's term next June. This will probably be the last decision announced. Yes. You, you know what? One, one other thing I wanted to ask you about. I, I thought it was fascinating in your amicus brief. You talk a lot about Justice Blackman at the time. And although he was part of the 5-4 majority, he was really haunted because he almost saw this coming, didn't he? Well, I think he did. I think the one that is really surprising is Chief Justice Berger at the time. Mm. You know, he and Blackman were sometimes referred to as the Minnesota Twins. And some believe that Justice Berger was kind of talked into this by Justice Blackman and that he wasn't fully on board that decision. Mm. But but when he retired several years later and wrote in the, his dissent in the Thornburg decision, at that time, he said, it's now time to rethink Roe versus Wade. We never imagined that it would lead to abortion being as widespread as it has become. And it was actually a seven to two decision. We had Justice Rehnquist and Justice White writing the dissenting opinions there. Yeah. But as I say, Justice Berger probably had some reservations at the time and expressed those later. And gradually we moved to where we had four justices that were ready to overrule Roe versus Wade. And that's not including these three that we have on the court now, Justice Gorsuch and Kavanaugh and Barrett. And so we think that there is a good likelihood that this is going to be a good decision. Okay, good. Well, we, we certainly need to be in serious prayer about uh, <clears throat> Kavanaugh, Barrett, and, 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 and Roberts. And uh, we'll throw Gorsuch in, the, in there too, Colonel. I think he's more reliable than the others. Okay, well, that we'll that's good to know. You know what? I'm feeling really, okay, I, I'm not supposed to say confident, right? So I'm going to share your optimism, okay? Well, 
And also, we both need to be, in fact, we all need to be in prayer over this. Yes, sir. You know, in Scripture, well, we read in the book of Proverbs that the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. Like the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. And the word there for king also means judge. God mm. can turn the hearts of judges. Mm. And pray for these justices. Pray for the lawyers that are presenting the case. Pray for the lawyers on the other side that God will confound and confuse them. <laughs> yes. And, Anyway, so we're hoping for a good result. Yes, sir. Well, uh, Colonel John Eidsmo, it's it's just been a delight. Uh, thank you for taking the time to help us understand this better. It's it's uh, you know we're talking about uh, fifty years of of obfuscation and uh, misinformation reported by the mainstream media. So this is just so extremely helpful. And thank you for all the work that you guys are doing down there with Judge Moore and the, the Foundation for a Moral Law. We appreciate it. If you'd like to look to our website, it is simply morallaw.org. Anything close to that and you'll find it. God bless you, Colonel. And you too. Thank you, Jim. God bless you. Bye.